Yes, indeed. Corey, good to see you, man. Great to be here, it's, as thanks always. Thanks for coming in to talk to us about your collection. When I walked in here and saw this, I'm like, man, have I just come to where bases go when they die or what? This is like bass heaven right now. I am absolutely obsessed with bass instruments. I have since the, the I discovered uh, the bass guitar at uh, around the age of 15. About mm -hmm. the time I turned 15, I uh, got my first bass guitar. It was an Aria Pro Cat bass. Um, and I had been playing guitar for about six months and uh, was uh, always a singer. Um, uh, of songs and uh, you know the the whole high school happenstance of uh, I sang for the the high school um, at a gathering and some guys said asked me if I could sing Tesla and uh, so I show up at band practice um, I get invited to to band practice and I show up uh, it was a Sunday afternoon and the the I asked where the bassist was and. Uh, they said uh, he had to go to church. His mom wouldn't let him practice on Sunday afternoons because he had to go to afternoon church service. Um, so I thought, how hard can it be? It's just four strings. And as soon as I grabbed the instrument and really started listening uh, for bass, I realized I'm a bassist. It's like it, it's ingrained in uh, who I am as a, as a person. Uh, come to find out, that's what I was always listening to. Um, I could hum the bass line to, to most any song, uh, so uh, it just became an absolute obsession. And here, 35 uh, years later, it's still an absolute obsession uh, of mine as bass and guitar in general. Well, that's incredible. And for anybody out there who doesn't know, uh, Corey is our store manager here, more music, more guitars. Uh, incredibly hard-working bass player. I don't think I know anybody else who is gigging as regularly as you are. And that says a lot, you know, for a person to be in that much demand, I know you're playing with at least four or five projects. At any at one point in time, yeah. Yeah, at any one point in time. And just going at it, uh, he is incredible bassist, you know, just the technique, I've heard the rec recordings he does, he knows exactly what needs to be happening down on that bottom end. So. Thank you very much. I, I have always had the philosophy of uh, it is as much about what you don't play as, as what you do play. Um, I find my role uh, as store manager and bass player to be extremely similar in that um, I like to be the behind the scenes guy, the, the guy in the background, um, kind of uh, providing a, a foundation for uh, others to, to shine and to show off their abilities and the like. It, it just gives me a whole lot of um, humble gratitude to look around the room and to see um, how surrounded I am by extremely good talent uh, in both facets not only on the bandstand, but especially here in the store. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you do have some uh, quite gifted uh, accomplices up there. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, um, we all suffer from imposter syndrome. I'm, I'm no different. Uh, you know, I, I doubt my abilities. There's, there's more technical bass players out there. Uh, there are players that can play circles around me. Um, and but I keep getting called and uh, you know when those doubts creep into my mind I take a look around the room and uh, you know um, I'm a firm believer in other people's opinion of me is none of my business uh, so I don't question their judgment when when they ask me to be in a room either playing music or uh, you know helping support them um, by being the store manager well, first, before we get into your collection, that brings up an interesting question. In, in all of my time going to guitar shops, you know, and of course, you know, I'm looking at it from a guitar aspect. So the people who I'm dealing with, you know, in a store are typically guitar players. Yes. And you bring something totally different to the party. And if you could, I mean... Tell me about how 
What, what is a basis? What are you looking for? When you come in, and it could be, well, I guess we'll focus on, you know, the guitar, but it's this, you know, the sound. It's something, it's a totally different realm, not only just the frequency range, but you're looking for different aspects of the sound than a guitar player is. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think that would be good for bass players to hear. How do you approach that when you when one comes into the shop and you're trying to steer them toward whatever they've got in their mind? That's a, a great question that I get a whole lot of. Um, playing bass, you are given inside of a band context. So let's, uh, let's put this into uh, playing rock and roll, country, blues, um, alternative music. Those have kind of been my, my areas of... Um, where I've worked the most, uh, you have certain frequency, a certain frequency spectrum to slot that bass in. Uh, if you have a drummer uh, and say two rock and roll guitar players, um, one playing a Gibson style humbucking guitar and one playing a Strat, a, a drummer with at least a 22 if not a 24 inch bass drum nowadays in rock and roll has kind of become the standard. Uh, lots of cymbals, all of that, that combined uh, sound and instruments covers a whole lot of the, the audio frequencies. So I'm looking for a bass that's going to slot in, it's going to marry to the bass drum, but it's also going to make the guitars and the vocalists relevant. Um, it may be uh, the P bass, which has a little bit of a, an accentuated low end and mid range. Um, P basses have a real bell-like tone to them that uh, works in almost every situation. It may be the, the short scale single coil um, that I've got flat wounds on, uh, a little bit thinner in the, in the low end, uh, but with a real woody whack that, that seems to cut through uh, snare drums, toms, uh, humbucking guitars. Uh, things of that nature, or uh, my humbucker equipped uh, Telecaster bass here, um, which is the, the absolute love of my life. Um, you know, it, it, it has just this murderous, thunderous low end, hardly any top end. So for more traditional styles of music, uh, especially with flat wounds on it, uh, say with a country band or with a blues band, it's going to really fill up that low end frequency. So uh, these guys with these hot blues and country licks can, can play on their really bright spanky uh, Telecasters or Stratocasters and uh, the low end's filled out. You know, I've got that covered for them. Well, wow, you covered so much ground in that, those few paragraphs. And thank you for that, Corey. That, that explains a lot. Um, well, this is probably a configuration that a lot of people are familiar with yes. when they hear a bass sound. Um, and that, uh, that tells them yeah, yeah. something else. Could you give us a demonstration of the difference in tone between this one? And oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think everybody would really... So I've modified this a bit. This is a 2018 Fender American Performer P bass. Um, that I received from Fender due to some online training and I won a uh, sweepstakes. Uh, so I named this one Frida the Ice, Ice Princess because she was free to me. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the first things I did, I've never been a fan of jazz bass pickups um, in the bridge. Uh, I don't tend to play music where uh, I'm out front. Um, so that's just not a tone that, that uh, I, my ears have grown accustomed to. So I've modified this. I've unwired the jazz bass pickup. I took out the, uh, the blend control and I dropped in a Fender Custom Shop 62 P bass pickup in, in this. Uh, the Yosemite pickup was a bit brighter and clackier than what I like and I wanted a little bit more output out of this. So it's wired up just like a, a straight precision bass. Um, one thing I do, I'll, I'll just demonstrate the tone control and how you can get some different sounds from a P bass. Okay. 
just by varying where my hand is, yeah. the P bass becomes a super versatile instrument. You'll, uh, uh, if I'm playing a ballad on, on the P bass and I want a little warmer tone, uh, I'll play up against the neck. If I want a little bit more driving sound, So I love P basses for that reason. Uh, the tone control, of course, is a treble roll off. Mine's usually set uh, at about 70% and rolled off about 30%. And this one has flat wounds on it, so uh, you know a big difference in tone between a P bass with round wounds and a P bass with flat yeah. flat wounds. Um, I find the the difference is with flat wounds you almost strictly get the fundamental note. With round wounds you get those harmonics over the top, which can be you know really beneficial. I've got a an active five string with, that I keep round wounds on. Right. For that reason, you know if I'm playing with a, a, a loud band or um, need a little bit more bite in the in the lower end of uh, in the upper end of the lower register. That's what I go to. Uh, let me switch this out. And what's what's a little bit of the story on this one? This is just so it's such an interesting looking instrument, and you can tell that it's been loved and used. It has <laughs> really, I, I have done most of the damage to this guitar. I've had this guitar uh, over 25 years. I was playing in a pop, a female pop country band at the time and uh, was working with a guitar player um, who thought he had a 71 Telecaster bass, but uh, it happened to be a, a 72. Uh, he was born in 71 and he had collected some 71 Telecasters um, and uh, this was in his collection and he brought it to my house uh, to a party and opened up the case and I pointed at it and I said, that's my bass. And he kind of laughed. I said, no, seriously, that's my, that's my bass. I had wanted one of these because as, when I first started playing, uh, like a, a lot of bass players my age, Billy Sheehan was the be all end all. And his wife bass was a precision bass with a Telecaster neck. And from Tim Bogert, uh, he had fallen in love with the sound of a humbucker uh, in the neck. So I thought, I need, a, I need a Telecaster bass, you know, and this is what I need. Well, it ends up, um, this was gifted to me um, by, that, by that guitar player. Uh, he since passed on, so. Uh, this is one of them that I have done literally, I've done well over a thousand gigs with this particular guitar. Uh, and uh, I don't break it out a whole lot anymore. For one, it weighs a ton. It, I was going to say, yeah, when you let me hold that yesterday, that has got some heft. Yeah, this, uh, this guitar, uh, back then they didn't care what the ash weighed and they just saw a slab of ash. And there it was. So this is the original P-Bass design in that it doesn't have any contours. Uh, it has a massive neck on it. Um, you know, this kind of cured me of thinking that, oh, I've got these little short stubby hands, I can't play this guitar. You can if you, if you want to, you'll play it. Um, but it is an absolute two-ton rhinoceros. Her name is Stella. And I tend to name my, my guitars uh, women's names and think of them as, as uh, uh, great partners. And it's called Stella uh, after the uh, scene in A Streetcar Named Desire where Marlon Brando is in the rain in the town square yelling, Stella! That's how this guitar makes me feel. I, it just, it is the joy of my life. Scream. Yes. Okay. So flat wounds on this.
lot more output out of this. I was going to say, this is, this is a very clean sound you've got dialed in here. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I can hear cactus. I can hear back voter. Absolutely. On, on that, that is... <laughs> That fuzzy 70s bass sound that uh, everybody was going for. I know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mountains bass player Felix Papayardi played a, uh, something similar to this. This was uh, Fender's answer to the Gibson EBO, is what this was. And uh, in uh, sometime around 70, 71, uh, Seth Lover went to go work for Fender and these uh, tuna fay pickups, uh, which stands for copper, nickel, iron, uh, is what the magnets are made of, um, became the standard for UC72 custom Telecasters or custom deluxes with two of these uh, style pickups. And um, this was called the Atomic Wide Ranging Humbucker, uh, but it was quickly named the Mudbucker by players. Oh my gosh. Incredible. And the output on it is ridiculous and it's just absolutely ridiculous um, anytime I, I bring two guitars and this is one of them I really have to do some tweaking as far as my uh, preamp and DI signal goes so I don't freak out a sound man uh, when I strap this one on but uh, yeah this is a, a one of those pieces I don't know that I, even if I were to pass, heaven forbid, that I would leave this with anyone. It might get buried with me. I don't know. I love her so. Well, Corey, I had to take a quick break there. Uh, got, a, got an audio problem fixed, and I noticed our light magically came on back here. So that's, oh, cool. I'm sure Brett will be happy about yes, that. So, yes, Okay. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask, you've got such a collection here and for people who aren't bass players I, I know people who are guitar players don't understand why if you've got one that sounds good and it works why do you need more of them there are lots of players who haven't who haven't you know james jamerson famously played on hundreds of of hits with just one bass um, you know, you're gonna find the right bass for you that you connect with. For me, it is, uh, you know, I wanna, I wanna try to be a sonic artist. And uh, so finding just the right sound uh, for the right song or the right genre um, is really, really important to me. You know, I spent years playing the same bass um, and as soon as I uh, got a couple different bases in my collection that that were different uh, I really started to notice the the subtle nuances and especially through recording uh, you can you can really hear a sonic difference um, you know like I said earlier there's there's a, a place for the the short scale with the single coil there's a place for the long scale with with the humbucker there's even a place for the uh, electric upright um, in certain tracks and the like. So I try to look at it as uh, purpose-driven. You know, you, you probably noticed my guitars are not perfect. Uh, they're banged up, they get played, they get played as much as I possibly can play them. Uh, I don't worry about scratches, nicks, things of that nature, uh, because uh, they're tools. And they're, they're colors in a palette that I have that uh, I can add to a sonic canvas and create a, a picture for somebody. Um, you know, whether that's a, a really cutting, aggressive tone. Um, if I feel like I need a, a cutting, aggressive tone, I'll go to one of these two guitars. If I want something, um, say I'm playing Americana or, or blues, or country, it's probably going to be the the tele bass or the music master uh, that I have. Um, you know, it just really all depends on the sound that you're going for. I know in store, when someone is looking for a first or second guitar, uh, bass guitar, and they come to me specifically, um, it's time to for me to ask the qualifying questions. So. Uh, you know, as consumers and buyers of these instruments, um, 
come in with a game plan. You know, uh, give, me, give me some answers to some questions so I can help lead you. What uh, I'm not going to do is pick your guitar out for you. You know, I'm not going to shove something in your face and say, oh, this is perfect, you should take this. You know, I may have ulterior motives for pushing that guitar, and it may not be centered around um, your sonic or playing needs. You know, it could be that, that uh, a guitar's been hanging for a while, you know. So we, we stay away from that as much as we possibly can. We don't want you to settle on an instrument or uh, take our word for it. You know, we want you to love that instrument and know that this is going to be the instrument that serves the purposes that you discussed with myself or my colleagues uh, with. So we'll ask a lot of qualifying questions such as, what kind of music are you into? Who are some of your favorite players? You know, which one of these instruments looks good to you? That's very important. Yeah. You know, if, if you don't like the way it looks, you're not going to want to play it. Uh, you can liken that to a plate of food. It can smell and taste great, but if it's gray, you're probably not going, you know, if the whole plate is gray, you're probably not going to, to be satisfied with that, with that plate of food. And that's the, the kind of thing that we want consumers uh, to know is don't settle. The, you know, don't, don't take the first thing that uh, a salesperson uh, places in your hand. Um, and also, we know that we're going to see you a few times. If you come in to our shop and you walk in and you're like, I want a new guitar. Well, what kind of guitar do you want? Well, I'm not really sure. We ask you a couple questions and 15 minutes later, you're like, yeah, this is, I'll take this one. Mm -hmm. And you're not beaming. It doesn't put a smile on your face. You're not excited about it. We don't want you to have the instrument. You know, we, yeah. we absolutely do not want you to have the instrument for a couple of reasons. One, we know we've not done our job to the highest level. And two, uh, we don't want to see that guitar back. You know, we want to we want to send it out with you, and we want you to keep it. You know, we want it to to be a forever, or at least a usable piece for you in in this time period. Yeah, I, I was telling Ed whenever I I really enjoy whenever I have a few minutes and I can just watch the way that the team interacts with customers. Um, you're you're playing matchmaker. Yeah, you're not. You're, you're not pushing anything. You're trying to find what fits. The, the challenge for us is to find the, through asking the qualifying questions, finding the three pieces that we f think uh, and feel like fit that criteria um, as far as looks, playability, uh, and sonically. Uh, we want to match all those things up to you and give you some options. Um, we tend not to give too many options because I know how I am. If, if I have a dozen options laid out in front of me, I'm not choosing, you know, four of them, let alone one of them. Uh -huh. But if I have three viable options that I can see myself playing and uh, in, in my mind's uh, ear hear myself playing, then yeah, I'm going to go with that, with that instrument. So. Uh, that's one of the most satisfying parts of our job is matching people up with just the right instrument. And especially when they come back and, and they say, I did that recording. Hey, listen, check out on Spotify or whatever streaming service. Check out this track I just did with, with this instrument that you sold me. Or check out these pictures from my gig the other night. Look how gorgeous that guitar looked and it sounded great with the band, you know. That is, um, it's so fulfilling. It really is. I really liked your description of yourself as a sonic artist because, because I am a studio engineer, that's one of the things that I do other than videos. I don't think that most people, including most bass players, don't realize that the fundamental, you know, the, the frequency of that low E string is right around 40 hertz, yes. which is 
right at the bottom of just about any speaker system's capabilities. It's if you get something with some big subs, and I, the, the, the character of every bass is by what the bass adds to that fundamental. And I can make, you know, people come in, you know, the studio with different guitars, different amplifiers. I can pretty much make a guitar sound like any other guitar with studio tricks. You can't do that with a bass. You really can't. It's, uh, you know, I, I've always thought that there, uh, along with all of the science that goes into these, nut width, uh, wood selection, what the frets are made of, how, how thick they are, or how tall they are, all of that puts the, the luthier in the ballpark of a sound. And then there is that certain something, it's, it, it is absolute alchemy or magic that particular instruments have that are made with the same materials as a thousand others, but there's gonna be that one that's really, really special. Um, and after a while, you, you start to recognize uh, what to look for. How does it resonate when when you hit the when you hit a note? Um, we can do a whole lot with EQ as far as bass goes, uh, but you can't change the the sonic signature of that particular instrument. Uh, you know, you can you can get into uh, ballparks with, you know, I know that this long scale instrument with a humbucker is going to be really thick in that 40 hertz, 40 to 180 hertz, it's gonna be super strong there. Uh, anything over uh, 800K is gonna be rounded off. You, you, you can see the taper uh, when you look at it on a computer and a recording device. Uh, the, the short scale with the single coil, the, the lows aren't quite as accentuated, uh, but that 180 to 800 hertz uh, is uh, a bit accentuated. And uh, so, you know, that's where, like, thinking of yourself as a sonic artist uh, comes into play. What are you, what kind of foundation, because that's what, what we're going for with every track that we do, is providing a foundation. What kind of foundation are we laying under uh, a particular artist's thoughts and sonic painting. And it's almost like, uh, you know, if you, it, I love Bob Ross, you know, the, the, base, the base is always the, the mountains in the distance or the, the grassy plain, you know. The, the guitar is the birds flying through. Uh, Nick Mason from the drummer for Pink Floyd they asked him what the most important uh, part of a band, uh, most important instrument in a band is, or member. And he says, well, let's get the definition of a band uh, straight. Um, to him, the definition of a band is a drummer, a bass player, and various novelty acts. So <laughs> you, you really have to think of yourself as like the, the bass, no pun in, well, pun intended, the, the bass of this, uh, structure that you're building sonically. Um, so what kind of foundation do you want to lay uh, underneath there? Is it open and airy like the, the short scale? Is it, um, is it bell-like uh, and full like the active five string is? Is it, are we, are we placing people in a swamp uh, you know, where, where the mud's sticking to your boots as you walk along, right. you know, you, you figure out where to place those particular instruments into that, that amalgamation of sound. And I, I, just a comment I have to make. The, every person that I talk to here about this, your passion for your instrument is so authentic and it's just so it's just so out there. Is that one of the things you think that makes this shop and this team a little bit special? Because I just don't see this I, in places. I, 
honestly do. Uh, and the fact that, that we are all such varied, not only musicians, but human beings, and um, that we all have the shared value of we are delivering music to people uh, through these instruments. You know, the ultimate, like I said, is, is having somebody come back in and say, look what I did with, with what you helped. You know, you place yourself inside, someone has allowed you to place yourself into their musical journey. And that is a gift in and of itself. When we get a lot of talk, uh, all of us are working players, and, and um, you know, especially in store, uh, people will say to Ed or Hannah or Scott or any of our uh, brick and mortar staff, yeah, I saw you play, you were fantastic. Uh, you know, I really loved what you, what you did there. You're so talented. And that, that word gets thrown around a lot, and we're very grateful for those sentiments. Um, what most people don't realize is that uh, talent is just the confluence of desire and hard work. We're all music lovers. At our base, what I've always thought as far as my role as a musician is to try to make people feel the things that I feel when I listen to music, whether that's happiness, sadness, longing, uh, anger, uh, aggression, all of those things. Um, they make me feel a certain way, and um, I like feeling like that. And um, I kind of embrace those emotions. So I want to, as a musician, deliver that same feeling to people. And as a retailer, I want to give players the tools so that they can provide th those feelings for other people. Well. I think you're being very successful in that, Thanks. just from the, from the customers that come in this shop and just the, just the atmosphere of the team. You've got a great bunch of people here. We really and I, do. I hope everybody out there realizes that when these guys are the experts in what they sell. Corey's talked about, you know, the, the Fender Academy. Many of our manufacturers have academies, and I think you've got master's degrees or doctorates in just about every one of them. <laughs> and that's mainly for the free stuff that they give you when you, yeah. when you complete. Because I'm going to be sitting at home, even if I'm not in the shop, I'm going to be sitting at home, I'm going to be checking out guitars. You know, it's always just been, it's been my passion, it's been my thing. You know, some people uh, uh, get into riding motorcycles, some people get into um, fishing or hunting. Uh, especially in our area of the, the world, it may be uh, remote controlled planes or drones or your thing. For me, it's guitars. So, um, you know, if I'm sitting at home, I'm probably checking out guitars. I'm probably listening to music. Um, and I am just so fortunate, and I, I want to look directly at the camera and say that I am so grateful to be a part of a team that is uh, allowed to be in this wonderful, wonderful in industry. Uh, and to be able to make music our life and our passion for music um, a part of our work life, uh, our hobby life, uh, and we want to bring that to your life. So, um, you know, come talk to us, give us a call, uh, email us, text us, uh, however you, you're comfortable getting in touch with us. We want to talk about your musical journey um, all day, every day. That's great. Corey, thank you so much for your time. Uh, one favor I'll ask of you, okay. if you've got a minute, I know anybody that has seen this is wondering about it. Could we break and I set that up and you just play us out on this? Absolutely. All right, thank you, man. To. More guitars. <laughs>